After bursting onto the scene at Protor Murders at Karlov Manor, the Rakdos Vampire's archetype has completely eclipsed all other versions of the color pairing in Pioneer and quickly rose to the S tier ranks of the format. While at its core, the deck still plays the normal black X mid-range grindy kind of game, the addition of a powerful combo package is what really makes the deck that much more powerful than any other version of Rakdos currently out there. Today, we're going to look at how the deck is built, how it wants to play the game, and what sideboard option it has so you can decide if you want to play and learn the deck or learn to play against the deck at your RCQs. Rakdos Vampires puts a twist on the classic mid-range deck definition, and while it still has the early game low mono disruptive spells with the kind of impactful low mono creatures in the early game to buy time to your mid and late game threats, it sort of trades in with the traditional green versions of these decks have in mana acceleration for a powerful two card combo, Soren Impervious Bloodlord and Vein Ripper. Bypassing the 6 mana requirement as early as turn 3, the Rakdos Vampires deck kind of just gets to skip to all the good parts of the mid and late game while other decks are still trying to set up their game plan or even establish a board at all. This punishes decks in a different way than the normal discard or removal package that the Black X mid-range decks usually does, and it hurts double as much when it's played in tandem with these types of effects. It's not a true combo deck due to, well, its resiliency and its ability to win without the two card win condition on a consistent basis. Vampires does, however, bring the best two parts of the archetypes together in a way we really haven't seen since Uro was around in the format. The main draw to the deck debuted at the Pro Tour was the combination of Soren, Imperius, Bloodlord, and Vein Ripper. Cheekily named Sorintel, based on the Show and Tell card that sparked an entire archetype still played in Legacy today, there's no secret way to play these cards really. Play Sorin as soon as turn 3 and use its minus kinda ultimate ability to put a Vein Ripper from your hand into play. Now you have a 6-5 flying creature that normally wouldn't be played until a few turns later. And it's got some pretty powerful effects. First off, it has an incredibly difficult ward cost to get around, sacrificing a creature. So sure, it dies to go for the throat, but it costs you a creature in the process. That works in tandem with its other effect, which says whenever a creature dies, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So that creature that was paid for ward, two life drained. The Vein Ripper itself, two life drained. So your two mana removal spell costs you a creature, for life and gained your opponent for life in the process. Ouch! Now, Sword has other abilities in addition to the ambushing out of a six cost creature from our hands. In fact, Soren is one of the older Oko-like planeswalkers that has two abilities that add loyalty counters. Both of these other abilities require us to have vampires in order to fully take advantage of them, which means we need to tweak the traditional package of Rakdos creatures and see if we could skew it to be a little bit more fang-like. Thankfully, almost all Rakdos decks were already playing one of the best vampires in the format, Blood Tithe Harvester. This insanely strong early game creature is card selection, removal, and a decent clock of damage all packed into just two Rakdos colored mana. The blood tokens it leaves behind help us toss cards that aren't worth using right now to find things we need, like a Vein Ripper to cheat it out the next turn. Playing standard for any amount of time recently will have introduced you to Preacher of the Schism, a card in a similar vein to Harvester. While it's not as offensively statted, it does provide card advantage, board advantage, and pressure thanks to Death Touch, all depending on our current life total. It also works on attack trigger instead of dealing damage, meaning we can swing our two power death toucher into things like Shieldred the Apocalypse without much thought, or besides getting some damage from drawing a card if we decide to get one, or a life linking token, while the opponent then has to decide if they lose their creature to death touch or not. That brings us up to 12 vampires in total with the Vein Rippers, so we're not too far away from enough to make Soren a electric in the list. We do still want to have ways to ensure we can hit cards we need, be it our Sora and Tell combo, removal for opposing threats, or even land to ensure that we curve out properly. 
Rakdos decks do have a plethora of ways to draw cards, which is usually the draw to them. No pun intended that time. Because Sorin helps our vampires grow and turns them into lightning helixes, we'd ideally want a vampire that draws us cards even if it doesn't do much else. Enter Dusk Legion Zealot. The painful cousin of cards like Elvish Visionary, Zealot fills our curve early while drawing us a card towards our mid and late game plays. Most importantly, Zealot provides a body on board after we play our Vein Ripper as a sacrifice effect is one of the cleanest ways to deal with a Resolve Ripper. Trading an Edict for a 1-1 feels real bad, especially when Ripper is going to also make it cost 2 life. Some decks will cap out at just 13 creatures, while others can go all the way up to 16 or more. In general, vampire decks will lean on their Rakdos roots a little bit and still play some number of powerful mid-range cards. Varying numbers of Shield of the Apocalypse, Archfiend of the Dross, and a vampire himself, Kalidus Trader of Get, see play in vampires lists all over Pioneer. Shieldred is still one of the strongest creatures in the format, often winning games of attrition without even needing to attack. She synergizes well with our blood tokens and preacher triggers, gaining us life just for drawing cards. Archfiend of the Dross does well as a Van Ripper complement that ends the game just as quickly with 6 power. While we may have to worry about the oil counters at some point, Archfiend also deals 2 damage when our opponent's creatures die, which worked great with Ripper's ward cost our Death Touching Preacher, Harvester's ability, and of course, our removal spell package. Kalidus is the most on theme card for the deck because it's a vampire, but it's also the least impactful in a weird way. While Kalidus can grow with our vampires and the zombies that it makes, its effect to create the zombies exiles opposing creatures instead of letting them die as a replacement effect. So we might lose out on the strength of Vein Ripper's drain effect if our opponent chooses to let us get some 2-2s. However, Kalidus is a stone cold killer against aggro decks thanks to lifelink. Besides Soren and his troop of vampires, the deck also packs Pioneer Powerhouse, Fable of the Mirror Breaker in the main deck, Another powerful rummaging effect to help find our cards, Fable puts a token on board that makes us a treasure token and attacks uninhibited thanks to Vein Ripper ensuring it deals its damage even if it gets blocked and dies. Most importantly though, it's the flip side of Fable in this matchup specifically. We can copy Vein Ripper. Sure, we still get a copy Harvesters for extra blood tokens and removal spells, but a second 6-5 that now makes every kill drain for 4 life is pretty massive. Don't forget, the token needs to be sacrificed at the end of the turn you made it, so that's a guaranteed dies trigger for four right there. A classic package of Pioneer Black Disruptive Spells is present across most Vampires lists, with Fatal Push and Thoughtseize being the most seen cards across them. Fatal Push works great with blood tokens and can combine with Sorin's sacrifice ability to trigger Revolt while also dealing three damage to something else to clear the board. Thoughtseize is still the best discard spell in the format and key for taking away cards from creatures to planeswalkers to combo pieces and a plethora of matchups, all for the low cost of one mana and two life. Bitter Triumph, Go for the Throw, and Heartless Act all see play depending on what you think you're going to be playing against, with Bitter Triumph being the best sort of catch all answer as it can hit just about any creature and works against planeswalkers. Heartless Act has the upside of removing counters from an opposing Archfiend of the Dross, making your opponents lose the game on their upkeep. Go for the Throw is at its best when creatures are your main concern and you don't want to be spending life or discarding cards. Duress also sees main deck play in some lists as needed extra discard effects for combo decks and even the mirror match. Stealing away an opposing Sorin while you get to resolve your own is close to game over there. Duress can also steal away to fairies and wandering emperors from control while taking away key spells like Sylvan Scrying or Pour Over the Pages from Lotus Field combo. Now a few lists do cut down on some creatures in order to run Smuggler's Copter, although it seems to be on the downtrend currently with some online lists. The Copter itself is a powerful 2 mana looting engine that can be crewed by even a singleton Dusk Legion Zealot. However, it doesn't play too well with Preacher of the Schism, as we miss Preacher's attack trigger and we can't leave up a death touch blocker. The Copter seems to be up to pilot preference, as it's also something that gets hit by temporary lockdown type hate cards, so that could be a reason to not include it if you anticipate playing against those spells more frequently. 
as a mid-range deck looking to grind with ways to discard cards it doesn't want to trade in for others, most Rakdos Vampires lists are on 25 or 26 lands. The lands for Rakdos Vampires get to take advantage of the creature theme in the deck, playing a full set of Mutavaults alongside the Rakdos mana base. Soren being able to pump the land over time means it can become a legitimate threat, while as well as being tossed for 3 damage to help end a game. While Mutavault works as a creature land, it only produces colorless mana, and we have Rakdos cards, so most lists are running 15 or more Rakdos producing dual colored lands. 4 Black Cleave Cliffs, Pathways, and Blood Crypt are seemingly the norm for decks, while the remaining sources are divided up between Sulphur Springs and Haunted Ridge. One benefit to the springs over ridge is that you can pay life to get yourself equal in life total to your opponent for Preacher of the Schism to give you both benefits of its attack trigger. While the downside is, well, you have to pay life to make colored mana and that could cost you in some aggressive matches. Lists seem split on the utility lands in the list, with most 26 card lists favoring a single copy of both Takanuma and Castle Lothwain, whereas 25 land lists seem to cut the castle. I personally love the castle and I know some of my games are going to be grinds as card draw adds up over time. Most lists only run basic swamps and no mountains, but there are some that put a single red source in their decks. To wrap it all up, Hive of the Eye Tyrant is the choice creature land alongside Mutable as a 3-3 menace body that is hard to deal with and has the added benefit of eating something from an opponent's graveyard such as a memory deluge. When it comes to mid-range decks in general, they sort of have a reputation as being toolboxes full of answers, and it's hard to find two decks with the exact same list of 75 cards. And the 15 sideboard cards are often the biggest culprit of these different types of variations. There are some cards that are universally shared between lists and Pioneer right now, and we'll talk about those before we kind of get into the more the niche options that I've seen in lists recently. Extra copies of Duress and Liliana of the Veil are the discard disruption package that comes in against combo and control decks. Basically, any deck that needs to have a critical mass of cards in hand or specific cards in order to operate is going to be met with me shoving all of these discard effects in the deck after game one so they don't get to play the game the way that they want to. Ashiok Dream Render is of a similar cloth as it comes in as a hate piece against graveyard based synergies as well as decks that want to search through their libraries in order to execute their game plan. The upside of milling the combo decks is that you have the percentage chance to mill over the cards they need to win the game, tempered by the fact that you could be milling away all of the dead draws they might have to find said combo pieces. So. Flip a coin. Reckoner Bankbuster comes in for our mid-range mirrors as well as control matchups so that you can keep stocked up on threats and answers alike as the game goes on with card draw. Especially decks with no smuggler's copter, the fact that Bankbuster can turn into a 4 damage attacker isn't to be undervalued when your opponents don't have artifact hate or non go for the throat removal in their lists. Path Apparel is here to stop aggro decks in their tracks regardless of how big their creatures may get. Because it cares about mana value instead of power or toughness, this card is a house against decks like Convoke, Heroic, and Prowess if they don't have the proper indestructibility effect in hand. Now, Graveyard Hate varies from deck to deck, with some lists packing the full four copies of Leyline of the Void to really hammer the decks using the yard. Others opt for a more subtle approach with two copies of Unlicensed Hearse to take away specific cards instead of all the cards in the graveyard. Go Blank also fills this role in some sideboards, sometimes in tandem with Hearst to fill the four slots that Leyline would often occupy. Go Blank does have the upside of also being a solid draw against combo and control decks and seeing a little more inclusion now because of that. Specific silver bullet cards can also be present in vampires lists and you should have these on your radar if you're looking to fight against them at your local RCQ. On the flip side, if you are the Vampires player, take a look at some of these cards. They have some effects that seem good against your local meta, then you should consider including them. If your local meta doesn't have the type of deck that these cards would shut down, you could skip them entirely in favor of more copies of the sort of stock sideboard cards. Damping Sphere is probably the most seen of these cards as it shuts down all flavors of Lotus Field from combo to control. 
In a pinch, I've seen the card brought in against spell slinging decks like Prowess and Phoenix, where I don't think it's at its best, but it could catch somebody off guard or punish a stumble on mana. Graph Digger's Cage is almost entirely for Amalia combo as it shuts down all of the spell packages that that deck plays. It also has some upside against the Is It Phoenix list, preventing the rebirth effect from putting them back into play from the graveyard. Shieldred's Edict is an additional removal spell that may or may not also see some small main deck play, as the sacrifice portion is great in the mirror match. It also has small upsides against Heroic and Control as well, as it can clear away a single Voltron built up creature just as easily as it can a Planeswalker like the Wandering Emperor. Now, Quakebringer is a card that prevents life gain side of things from Amalia decks while providing some small value from the graveyard. Although we have no other giants in our list to trigger that ability, we do have Mutavolt, which can tap itself to become a giant vampire abomination and shock our opponents on our upkeep, a trick that can add up damage over time alongside a Shieldred or Vein Ripper triggers. Finally, Hostile Investigator is popping up in sideboards after a decent showing at Pro Tour Outlaws of Thunder Junction in the Golgari Standard decks, and was highlighted as a standout in a Channel Fireball article from our favorite BG boy Reed Duke. Ogre, Rogue, Detective doesn't quite hit the vampire theme of the deck, but turning our discard spells into clue tokens in addition to being a discard spell with a 4-3 body isn't bad against mid-range mirrors and even some control decks. While well, we've got what's in the deck broken down, including what we'll want from the sideboard, so let's go back to the beginning now that we kind of have all the cards locked down, and let's talk about how Vampires really wants to play the game. Since the deck is a mid-range deck with a lot of interactions, some of the choices that you make will depend on the information you have, such as what your opponent's deck is, where you are, and what's in your hand, and what you think your opponent actually has. I'll try to adjust all those kind of variations when I can, but I'm not going to be able to hit every single scenario there is. For starters, let's take a look at what most considered the quote-unquote nut draw from Rakdos Vampires. This is the sequence of events that not only shot the deck up to the top ranks of the format, but also gained the ire of most pioneer players on its way there. The sequence involves a turn 1 Thought Seize to ensure we strip away interaction, followed by a turn 2 Dusk Legion Zealot, and then a turn 3 Soar and Tell combo with Vein Ripper. This sequence is the most powerful of them all, since Dusk Legion Zealot drawing a card adds to the probability of us seeing Soren and Vein Ripper each by a whole 4 percentage points on the play. Although it seems like the deck has this every game you play against them if you ask anybody at your local game store, this exact sequence only happens 5% of the time on the play. That's a 1 in 20 chance, which is low enough that most Vampires players can go an entire 5 or 6 rounds or an FNM without seeing the nut draw once. Of course, there are other versions of this hand that you could see. Turn 1 Fatal Push into turn 2 Bloodhide Harvester, naturally drawing the Sore and Tell combo does exist, or you can replace a Thought Seize with a Duress, so while each of these has about a 4 or 5% chance on the play of happening, the fact that there are multiple versions of the sequence does add up to become more frequent than the best possible draws for other decks in the format. It's also important to note that this doesn't instantly win the game, and playing a 2-drop creature is incredibly important to combat decks playing things like Shieldred's Edict as a way to stop your Vein Ripper. More commonly with the Vampire's deck, you're going to be playing out your turns more slowly and fair than Windmill slamming a 6-5 on turn 3. Your biggest decisions are going to be around when you should use your spells, and when it's clear for you to tap out for a powerful card of your own. Playing a tapped Blood Crypt over an untapped Black Mana for a Fatal Push at the end of an opponent's turn, holding Thought Seize as a way to clear the path for Soren over immediately attacking a combo deck's hand on turn 1, or even playing a Mutavault on turn 1 so you can get aggressive ASAP are all examples of choices you may encounter when playing Vampires. While there isn't a catch-all solution to these, it is important to remember how many of each card you have left in your deck and what ways you currently have of trying to find them. This will give you proper threat assessment and let you know what cards to pull the trigger on or not. 
classic Rakdos lines like a thought seize into Blood Tithe Harvester into Fable of the Mirror Breaker still exists with this deck. And it's a pretty solid curve and hard to not just want to play that out every time. And I would suggest you do. Soren without Vein Ripper is also a powerful play, as you can sometimes put games out of reach with just Lifelink from a now a 4-3 Blood Tithe Harvester or 3-3 Mutavault. And don't forget, the creature that Soren targets with its first ability also gains Death Touch, which makes getting in chip damage early much easier than the normal Rakdos list could. You'll struggle more when opposing decks start ripping apart your own hand, especially if you kept a hand which is too far down the combo side of your deck. Losing a Soren when your hand is removal, lands, and vein ripper isn't going to win you many gains without some lucky top decks, so mulligan decisions to find a proactive 1, 2, 3 curve will be better than going all in on the combo, especially when you know your opponent has some disruption. Because of your removal package, the ability to put out a giant creature ahead of the curve and synergy between those two sides, Fractos Vampires is a powerful deck against almost all of the creature-reliant decks in the format. That isn't limited to just aggressive decks either, but also decks like Is It Phoenix that rely on multiple combat steps to win will suffer at the hands of Vampires. Decks that are going to have a hard time removing Vein Ripper are also in trouble against Vampires, including Azoria's Control that has had to pivot their deck setup to either include more sweepers or tokens so they have a way to pay the ward cost on Ripper. Rakdos Sacrifice also cries in the face of the Vein Ripper as the card single-handedly turns the Cat Oven combo against its owner. Lotus Combo can do well against Vampires on the blind, but with a lot of discard spells and Sorentel to provide a faster clock than older Rakdos lists, I think the Pendulum swings fairly in favor of Vampires here. Now decks that can ignore Vampires or go over the top and bigger than Vein Ripper don't have quite the same difficulty against the deck. Surprise, surprise. Enigmatic Incarnation continues its winning ways against Rakdos based decks by the color pairing not having a good way to deal with enchantments, and the Niv to Light decks also boast a decent matchup against the Rakdos Vampires deck as they just have so many ways to find answers to Vein Ripper or Soren or whatever the Rakdos deck is playing out while presenting an equally large creature as masters of this mid-range kind of mirror style. Transmogrify or creativity lists that flip into Atroxa Grand Unifier are also well positioned against vampires, as a 7 7 Phyrexian Angel finding a fistful of cards and having keyword soup printed on it often is enough to beat a Vein Ripper. Amalia combo is one that can kind of go either way, but Amalia's life total is often enough to put a buffer to find what they need to combo again and squeak out wins against Rakdos unless they have a very fast opener to disrupt them. Now the one outlier sort of in these bad matchups is the mono black waste knot deck since it doesn't really ignore the vampires deck so much as it just stops them from doing what they want to do entirely. So kind of the exact opposite. Way too much discard to realistically keep a Soren Tell hand around for turn 3, vampires can still steal games from the top of their deck, but Waste Knot itself provides a problem when your draw effects are also discarding cards that trigger the enchantment itself. Rakdos Vampires might just be the most popular deck in the room when you head to an RCQ, so you'll need to know how to play against it, even if you're the one piloting it yourself. <laughs> Making sure to understand how your cards play alongside one another is going to be crucial, as learning to recover from your Soren Tell combo not being enough to win the game itself is going to be something you kind of have to learn. You're a grindy deck at heart, so my best advice when playing through leagues and practice matches is don't concede early just because your first attempt at things didn't win you the game. You have lots of ways to grind out tiny points of damage, and killing Vein Ripper doesn't mean that Soren instantly dies or becomes useless either, which will allow you to claw back some lost life and deal meaningful damage with your other vampires or a cheeky mutavault fling. 
seasoned Rakdos pilots can probably pivot to this version without too much change in their playstyle, except maybe learning some extra mulligan lines with this combo in your deck, while newer players probably want to play at least 20 games with the deck, which is like roughly 7 to 10 matches altogether. This gives you the chance statistically to experience the nut draw of turn 3 Vein Ripper while learning to play the deck without it as well. If you enjoyed this rundown on Rakdos Vampires, make sure to thumbs up the video on your way out and leave a comment down below about if you're excited for the deck or if there's other decks in Pioneer you're hankering to try out. As always, make sure you tap that subscribe button to stay up to date on the latest deck techs, metagame analysis, and in general, magic content. See you later.